Today I'm going to speak on a topic, uh, breaking strongholds, experiencing freedom and healing from that which steals, kills, devours and destroys. But I, I probably need to give a, a warning up front because sometimes when I speak on topics like this, there will be a bit of an internal battle going on for you and sometimes you might even find like you might suddenly feel like you've got a headache coming on or you just want to get out of here. If that's what's happening for you, recognise it's part of the battle but it's not of God that's trying to drive you away because the truth that you'll hear today can set you free. So just be open to that. If you're under an intense battle, just grab someone you know who follows Jesus and have them pray for you so that you can be at peace and stay and receive. So let me go to some scriptures. Uh, John chapter 10 verse 10, Jesus speaking, The thief comes only to steal, steal, kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So the contrast of the enemy of God is like a thief who just wants to rob from our lives compared to Jesus who wants to bring fullness in all its total measure into our life. Peter wrote these words, Be alert and of sober mind, your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And Peter actually had experience of being influenced by Satan <laughs> at different times. And so he's writing it as a warning that, hey, we actually have an enemy that wants to devour, but we can stand up to that and we can come out from under that devouring effect in our lives. So how does Satan devour? Well, most people immediately think back to the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve, but I, I just want to take a little example from Cain, one of Adam's sons. And with Cain and Abel, uh, God said this to Cain, If you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So what was that sin that was crouching at Cain's door? Jealousy of his brother, anger. It's like anger's knocking on his door and when Cain invited anger into his heart, it grows and it grows till it dominates and that anger became murder. Sin was crouching at his door. Let me give you an example of telling a lie. So imagine you told a lie during the week and you're convicted by God's Holy Spirit about that. What do you do with that? Well, number one, you go to God and say, God, forgive me for telling a lie. And then God prompts you. Now you go to the person you lied to and confess to them and say, will you forgive me? I told a lie, maybe out of fear or embarrassment or whatever it was. And you put it right. And the Bible's promise is if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So sin of a lie is knocking on your door. You put it right, it backs away from your door. You're cleansed. But if you let it in, it begins to grow. In Ephesians 4, 25 to 26, we read, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood a form of lie, if you like, and speak truthfully to your neighbour. So not only do we confess our sins, but we repent or turn from them. So I put off falsehood. I turn from that. I confess my lying, my deceit, whatever it is. I put off the falsehood and I make a new commitment to truthfulness. I'm turning from that. In your anger, do not sin. So all of us experience emotions of different kinds, anger, fear, uh, sadness. All, all these emotions are strong. It, it's like anger's knocking at your door and we can open that door and let it come in and it starts to move from an emotion to now we're making sinful responses. We're believing lies. We're making choices based out of our anger. 
and sin is trying to get in and dominate in our life. And then the next part of that verse says, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Why? Because in our emotional states, if we don't deal with something quickly, like before the end of the day, what happens? And do not give the devil a foothold. So when we don't deal with the sin that's knocking on our door, it comes in and it gives the devil a foothold or a stronghold in our life. An influence that's going to rob, steal, devour, destroy us in some way. Now, a definition for a stronghold or foothold. A stronghold is a negative effect in our life that goes beyond a one-time sin, such as I told a lie, one-time emotion such as anger, thought or sin, it is an influence of the enemy that enslaves or robs us in some way. So sin is dealing with a lie. A stronghold is I've become a liar. It's become a habit. It's become something that dominates me in an area of life. And it can affect us in the physical realm, the emotional, mental, relational spiritual every part of life it can have an effect now the five most common re reasons the enemy gains an influence so, so i'm speaking this out of experience of ministering to many different people over lots of years the five most common reasons the first one is deep hurt fear trauma or wounding especially as as a child so some of gracie's story is she was wounded as a child. And those strongholds that came into her mind in her thinking and her sense of her worth, it was affecting her because of those childhood things that happen. Sin and rebellion. We don't have to have someone else start the problem. We are capable of just giving in temptation ourselves or making choices of rebellion. So if your mother says you are never to drive a red sports car and you choose rebellion, what is the only car you are going to drive? A red sports car. You, are not, you think you're rebelling into freedom, you just rebelled into slavery and bondage to you have got no other choice. Okay, sexual sin. Sexual sin is a big one. Very, very powerful sexual desires and longings that we all have. It's a God-given thing. And God created sexuality to have its fulfillment within the confines of a marriage between a man and a woman for life. That's God's ideal. Now, we don't always hit God's ideal, and so that's why we need healing and we need things to work of God's grace. But let me, let me explain this. Sin comes to knock on our door and many times I would believe all of us in one form or another have had the sexual temptations knocking on our door and it desires to master us so we become enslaved to those desires and become addicted to certain forms of sexuality but we must master it. We need to learn God's grace and self-control and yield under God's purposes and designs for sexuality. Now, I have personally prayed for people. If you could think of a form of sexuality, I have prayed for people for that and seen people set free. Every sort. I could list them. I could tell you stories. But just know that God can forgive, he can cleanse, but many times when we open the door to sexual involvement outside of God's design, it becomes something that masters us. I'm going to invite Keegan up to just share a little bit of his story about some strongholds. Thanks, Keegan. Alrighty, so I'm terrified. <laughs> Ken literally was like, hey, you want to do this? I was like, uh, not really, but cool. <laughs> um, so... I've, been, I've known Ken for about maybe, what, two and a half years, three years? Yeah. yeah. And uh, we went through a bit of a prayer session at one point, and Ken kind of just, like, opened the door to a bunch of stuff that I've been dealing with for years. 
And um, one of the biggest things was sexual sin. Now, I didn't know or understand what was happening. When I was younger, I was sexually abused and I found that there was actually a lot of things that kind of changed my way of thinking, changed my self-worth, made me feel like I was inadequate, I was unable, I was, I was imprisoned. And so how that manifested was that I sought comfort in any way I could. Now, I'm a very emotionally connected person by nature, and I found that a lot of the time those things weren't actually being met, so I would seek them out in ways of looking at like pornography or other things, and I found that over time that became habitual. And I didn't actually understand at the time, but I was also dealing with generational curses, which I think you're going to be talking about in a minute, but that made my life incredibly dark. I would go to church and I would talk to my friends and I would talk to my family and none of them understood what was happening. None of them knew about my struggle and none of them actually could even understand the depth of how much it was killing me inside. I was becoming so much more of a person that was projecting who I thought God wanted me to be. I was pretending to act like kindness. I pretended to give everything I could to be the absolute epitome of being like what kind of a man you would expect a Christian man to be. But the thing is, is that inside, I felt like my heart was getting robbed. I felt like the, the bars of my sin were getting thicker and thicker. And I felt like my heart was getting darker and darker. And every single time I heard a sermon that was about forgiveness and freedom and, and access to this mercy, I didn't understand what it was and I would run out of the church as fast as possible because I felt like my heart was just not going to ever, ever, ever feel that. And I thought, that's great for everybody else, but not for me. How could I, the king of sin, <laughs> be accessing that kind of freedom? Now, about two years ago, I was having a chat with Ken <laughs> and it was just a chat about life and Ken just went through this prayer ministry session and we, we uncovered a few things that were strongholds in my life, one, this being one of them. And the thing is, is that he asked me a very simple question. He said, have you ever asked God how he sees you? And I said, no, <laughs> because why would I? I thought I was like scum, like I was dirt, like I was, I was like this slime in God's presence. And I was just fraudulently, fraudulently accessing his knowledge, but not actually experiencing his freedom. And when, I, when we sat and we thought about that, I, I I saw a picture in my head and it was as clear as day and it was just light, a being of light. Now that, that changed how I saw myself because for the first time ever, I was given access to mercy and access to forgiveness and the depth of my sin was nowhere near the depth of his forgiveness. And at the end of the day, that has pivotably changed my entire life. I'm able to walk in and see people's heartbreak and know the heartbreak because God's heart broke for my, me and he met me in that sin and he met me in that pain. But the thing is, is that when we're talking about strongholds, it doesn't have to be something that takes you and makes you run out of a church because you think you're not good enough. This is a place for people who are broken. This is not a hospital. This is a hospital for the broken people. This is not a museum for good people. <laughs> so don't ever think that you're not worthy. Don't ever think that you're not ready for that kind of mercy because God is ready to meet you in it and look at you in the eyes and say, I see you and I see all you've done and the depths of the emotional trauma. And I have been in it with you from the very beginning. And I see your pain and I see your heartbreak and it broke me and he took everything from me and he replaced it with an unimaginable glory and a mercy and a forgiveness and an overwhelming sense of just family and love and every single person is able to access that freedom there is nothing holding you back only the thoughts of the enemy saying that you are unworthy and that you are not able to access that mercy and those thoughts that realign your thinking to make you feel like you're unworthy are the things that are going to keep you imprisoned. 
But God walks into that prison cell. He takes you by the hand and he runs out and he destroys it. It is never, ever coming back. So let him hear you and call out to him and just ask for his mercy and forgiveness and he will freely and lovingly give it. Sorry. (laughs) Preach it, Keegan. (laughs) Do I do an altar call now? (laughs) Wow. (laughs) He said, he whispered to me, he said, I I just said, do you ever test me about getting free of any strongholds? (laughs) And then he said, I suddenly got really nervous (laughs) because he's never shared that publicly. He shared it with me. Okay, that's a big area, number three. (laughs) Number four is generational sin and curses, and this is where strongholds seem to go like a pattern through a family. It's like everyone... It's marriage in this generation's fails. It's like, what, what is that? Everyone seems to be robbed in some area through the generations. And the, these are patterns that we say, okay, maybe there's some kind of stronghold that's come into the family that we actually need to address. Then there's false gods, cults, the occult and the new age. Because they're forms of counterfeit spirituality and power. And people tap into it out of their pain, out of their looking for hope, looking for direction and guidance. But when we tap into this, we actually tap into another kingdom, not the kingdom of light. And when we access that kingdom, it brings strongholds that, that affect our health, affect our mind, affect uh, our family. And God wants us to clean out our houses and deal with that stuff and get free. I'll just add um, one, one comment to the whole area of sexuality. Uh, our local state government um, likes to pass laws that say we want those who have different sexual expressions to have total freedom to do that. In fact, if someone is struggling in any of those areas and goes to a pastor or goes to a family friend or to a member of a church, the government has passed laws that says we cannot help that person move away from this form of sexuality. Otherwise, we will find you hundreds of thousands of dollars. We will send you to jail if you dare to do that. But in their mercy, they said that we're allowed to teach the word of God. So the word of God says, any hint of sexual immorality is something where to flee from. That's what God's word says. And God's word says that even though once we were sinners and once we're in all these sexual perversions, when we know Christ, we can come into something new. So how do we... uh, who want to pray for people to be set free, do that without ending up in jail? That's a big question. So the way we suggest is when people come forward and say, I've got some sexual areas in my life I need God's freedom for, we just simply say, well, why don't you confess to God whatever you believe you need his forgiveness and cleansing and freedom from? And then I will just pray for you that God will set you free from anything that's not of God. There, I didn't lead you anywhere. You just did business with God and I just supported and prayed. And God can do what man says is not allowed to happen. (laughs) Okay. Let me use uh, an illustration your fault, Keegan. I'm still trying to recover. <laughs> let, me, let me use a simple illustration. I want you to imagine you're on Mount Kosciuszko in the middle of winter and it is like snow outside. It is freezing, like sub-zero temperatures. 
and you get the fire going and you stoked it right up and you're sitting in front of this fire, but it's like, oh, there's still this cold draft in here. What, what's going on? You know, and you poke the fire and get some more wood on it and get it hotter and you sit there and it's like, yeah, I can feel some of the warmth, but there's this cold draft that keeps coming around. You know, what's going on here? And then you go over to the side windows and look behind the curtains and suddenly you realise that all the windows are broken. And it's like, whoa, no wonder this cold draft is getting in here. And then the next thing you notice, there's a family of possums running around in your lounge room. And you say, well, how did they get in? Oh, they got in through the broken windows. And that's a little bit like what it's like, that sometimes we say, God, why is this cold draft? Why is this negative effect having such influence into my life? And, and we stoke the fire and we say, we need more of God's love and warmth. Yes, you do. But sometimes it's not just about having God's life and warmth and love. It's about recognising we have broken windows where the enemy has gained influence, either in the sense of a cold draft that just takes away God's warmth. Or sometimes it's, it's like this little enemy that gets inside and somehow causes havoc in our lives. I'm going to highlight uh, with a couple of diagrams... Firstly, a non-Christian with strongholds. So this person has areas of fear, of unworthiness, migraines, various things are affecting their life, robbing them of the life that God has designed. But then this same person becomes a believer, a follower of Christ. And the Spirit of God comes inside and makes that person alive. So we'll look at the second slide. And this is someone that their spirit has come alive, but has all the strongholds automatically gone the moment they become a believer? Not normally. <laughs> I think most of us would have to say, yeah, when I became a believer, I, there was still some things I struggled with. But the next slide or next image is about the same person as a believer now partially whole. So maybe when they encountered the warmth and love of God, this sense of unworthiness, the lie of it broke off. And it's like, I finally feel loved and accepted. Maybe they recognised they needed to turn from some of the outward sexual sin which they dealt with, but inside they still struggle with the area of lust. And so this person is partially whole. But in, God, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5... We actually discover God wants us completely whole. Let me read this. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you. That means to make you holy and pure and clean and set apart for God. Sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, that's mind, will, emotions, personality, and body be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. The one who called Gracie is faithful, and he did it. The one who called Keegan is faithful, and he did it. So we've mentioned that a stronghold can affect us in areas of physical, emotional, mental, relational, and spiritual. But also, it can be caused by different realms. So let me give you an example. So a physical negativity in your life, if you like, could be caused by diet and lack of sleep. That's not demonic. That's just, I'm not eating wisely and i am got so much going on in my world, I'm not sleeping. They're physical things that are affecting you, caused by the physical realm. But let's have a look at re relational. Maybe there's a whole lot of broken relationships in your life and what's it caused by? It's caused by self-centeredness and lack of understanding of healthy relationship principles and dynamics. Is it demonic? Not necessarily. <laughs> it's just simply you are violating God's design for how relationships are meant to work. But some things are caused by spiritual influences. And that's what I want to focus on a little bit further today. 
And those spiritual influences, the New Testament reveals, are called unclean spirits uh, or demonic spirits, evil spirits. And we read about one example in Matthew chapter 9, 32 to 33, but I'll just read it now. While they were going out, that's out of the synagogue, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk or out of the house, maybe. Uh, anyhow, while they're going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. Now, when we hear the word demon-possessed, what comes to mind? Every Hollywood movie that's ever made something about evil. Possessed has the idea of completely taken over where you are so not there. But the word actually is demonized literally meaning coming under the influence of a demon. So what was the one area that the evil spirit was influencing in this man? What was it? He could not talk. He was mute. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. So if this mute person became a believer in Christ and the muteness was caused on this occasion by a demonic spirit, it can be caused by physical things, and they became a believer in Christ, would they automatically be healed of the muteness? The only way to deal with it, if it's an evil spirit-based thing, would be to drive it out. Okay, here's a second example. Luke 13, 10 to 15. And it refers to, Jesus says, you know, refers to a daughter of Abraham, so a woman of faith, crippled by a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. For 18 years, this woman had a spirit that was crippling her body. Now, there are people like Mary Magdalene that is referred to as seven evil spirits. So obviously the evil spirits in her life were affecting her in different ways, not just in one single area. Okay, I, I will share one simple story. So I was praying for a new believer who had, there was a lot of occult background uh, in her past. And we were dealing with some of the evil spirits and their influences over her life. And then I went to pray for, she had arthritis. Now, arthritis can be caused by purely physical symptoms, okay? We get older, we get arthritis. So yeah, those kind of things. But she, as a fairly young woman, was in incredible pain through arthritis. And I prayed, I took authority, and I commanded all arthritis to leave her body and she described it, it just the, the pain intensified, first of all. It's like on fire, this pain. And then she said it just felt like it just, I could, she could feel it going out through her fingers and out through her, her f legs. And then she, she was like pain-free, able to do ha all this movement. On that occasion, it was connected with the occult involvement. We dealt with that took authority over those influences and then took authority over the stronghold that was also affecting her physical body. Okay, let's have a look at evil spirits' effect on the mind and the emotions. So we've tackled the physical, mind and the emotions. The one that comes to most people's mind who know their Bibles is Mark chapter 5 about the guy called Legion, the madman in the tombs. And that's, if you like, the most extreme version you can come across with demonic. He had so many that they called themselves legions, like thousands of them. And on that occasion, there was a bit of a battle even for Jesus to get the man free. But Jesus won. Um, a second example, 1 Samuel 16 verse 14, referring to King Saul. And it says, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul... And an evil spirit tormented him. In what area, for those that know your Bible, in what area was King Saul tormented? In the area of the mind. How did it start? Where did, that, where did the crossover happen? Because if you study the life of King Saul, he was forever 
living out of fear of what other people thought. The foundation, the struggle for him, the sin that was knocking at his door was fear. He allowed it in and it grew to become jealousy, to become anger, to become rage and to become murderous in his attempts to take David's life. We don't know when it crossed over from sin knocking on the door to where something now was mastering him and driving him. Let's jump over to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 18, the parable of the unmerciful servant. And the context is the king cancelled one man's massive debt, millions of dollars he owed. And then he didn't want to cancel someone else's debt and wanted them to pay up. He would not, in a sense, forgive. And this is the conclusion of the story that Jesus said. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant? So it's like the king speaking. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured or tormented until he should pay back all he owed. And then listen to these very, very sobering words. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Wow. Jesus says that God himself who's prepared to cancel all our debt, every sin, every filth that we have been involved in. Forgive the lot, mercy upon mercy. But if we do not forgive someone else who's wronged us, God himself hands us over to tormentors. We're in a prison and we don't get out until we pay. Or we call on God for mercy by choosing to extend mercy. Who are the tormentors? Many times when people hold bitterness, resentment and unforgiveness, it's like they come into a prison of that and then there's something of the spiritual realm that starts to drive their life and rob from them. What are some practical steps? There's a lot of good news. <laughs> you don't have to stay in a prison, not for one day longer. Some practical steps. If you have experienced hurt and wounding, uh, trauma, bound by fear, we can bring those emotions to God. Give that to God. Give God the fear. Give God whatever we went through. Release that to him. And if someone has been a cause of that in our life, we can choose to forgive. And that will enable us to come out of that prison and find God's mercy. But if we have responded to that through anger and holding the bitterness and making choices based on the lies that I have no worth or what does it matter? I got sexually violated. What does it matter if I just sleep around? Whatever it is, those areas, if we would confess it, call it for what it is. We would repent saying, I'm willing God to turn from this direction, believing this lie, and I'm making a new commitment to truthfulness, to holiness, to purity, to um, mercy with others. That re releases, if you like, the hold of it. But there's one more step when it's become a stronghold in our life that's important to take. And that is this. We break strongholds by taking authority. And for those that we were training over the weekend, we had a little picture stack, a set of pictures, and we referred to the rod of Moses, which reminds us to take authority. Because Moses is standing at the edge of the Red Sea. There's this enemy pressing down upon him. And the people are crying out, like Moses, do something. And so Moses cries out to God, God, you do something. And basically God said, what do you mean me do something? I put a rod in your hand, the rod of authority. You stretch out that rod and you use that rod and you command the sea to part. And many times when we pray, 
We say, God, you use your rod of authority in heaven and you do something. God, have, please help this person, heal this person, set this person free. God, do something. God, we beg you, we beg you. And God says, what are you begging me for? I gave you the authority. You have to exercise your authority. Yes, lead them through confession. Lead them through steps of repentance. Let the, help them forgive. But then you take the authority and set the captives free. That's what we're to do. How do we do this in simple terms? And this is mainly for those I was training, but if you want it as a freebie, you can take it as well. And it's this. The, take authority by remembering the rod, R-O-D. R, recognise that I am God's spiritual policeman. What does that mean, God's spiritual policeman? See, if you're a policeman directing traffic, and someone's driving too fast, you don't go, oh, please, sir, don't drive so fast. You know, there are other people on the road. You, no, you say, stop in the name of the law. You're driving too fast. Or criminal, you know, I'm going to arrest you. <laughs> um, you use your authority that's been invested in you as you act on God's behalf. And O is, oh, what option shall I choose to deliver the life and power of God through? Is it the oil of anointing? Is it the laying on of hands, the word of command, a command, a, a cloth for healing? What is the option that I'm going to deliver God's power to this person? And D is for declare or command the problem, the spirit or body what to do. So when Jesus was dealing with a demonic spirit, he says this, you deaf and dumb spirit, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. That's a declaring about God's intentions for freedom for that person. And if you ever happen to have, be in a situation where you're saying, come out in Jesus' name, and there's a bit of a battle as if this little thing saying, I don't want to, <laughs> then just remember, if we get it up on the picture, you can see the next one. Uh, keep going. <laughs> keep going. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> So sometimes when I'm praying for someone and there's a battle going on of some sort and we're not winning, the thing's not letting go, I, I picture this image and I say, it's okay, it's like Satan's forces are holding on with their fingers to something. So I back off and I just say, okay, God, shine your light. What, what's the reason this is holding? Okay, there's bitterness and unforgiveness. They, okay, they forgive and suddenly we, they're free. Maybe it's something else. And we just take the time, get the fingers undone, CRC, giving God the hurts, and then we take authority and we see the breakthrough. And one final tip in taking authority. Authority is not in the loudness of your voice, but in the conviction of your spirit. When you really know your authority, you don't have to be loud. Now, I can get passionate and I can sometimes get loud. <laughs> But it's not in the volume. It's in the knowing that God has given you authority as a son and daughter of God to set the captives free.